it was a, it was a requirement to get your certificate. You had to have piano proficiency and you were expected. My mother was a kindergarten teacher during all this time. You were expected um, to, to in the morning to play those, you know, kind of rousing patriotic songs that got the blood moving, got the day started, along with playing the Star Spangled Banner and singing the Star Spangled Banner during the Pledge of Allegiance, all of that. But there was always a, the teacher playing the piano in the classroom to, give, to start the day every single day. So music was so much a part of what we did. And of course, we, we're not going to go through the whole thing about lamenting how bad it is now compared to that. And we won't go through that. That's another two or three hours. But, but the fact is that that was there. And in all of those instances, people were expected to know the melodies of those songs. And they were expected to be able to deliver those melodies. So melody was something that was of, of extreme importance to people. Variation and variations on melodies and all of that came up, had it, although it had been around, it was, a, it was a development of the black community in the beginnings of jazz music. Because it was a development of the black community, it was the, 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 the genius of it, the accolades that would be attributed to it, they were suppressed because it was something that was developed in the black community. So it took someone to be the face of the genius of it. It took a person to be the face of the genius of it. And that had to be someone that was not only personable, just like any figurehead that you can think about today, LeBron or somebody that's a positive person, great at what they do, positive person, doesn't get into trouble, uh, speaks well, goes, you know, is, is a good spokesperson for almost anything that you want to throw him in front of. Um, you have to have a person like that that could deliver these types of attributes when it came to music. And that person was Louis Armstrong. And we don't, you know, we, Reference Louis Armstrong now, you know, we all know the characters of the big face and the eyes and the gravelly voice, and we know all the stuff we probably have heard of the song Hello Dolly, because that was one of his biggest hits later in his life. This was, you know, he had that he had that hit in the 60s when he was already 60 years old. And we probably know that and know some of the kind of stereotypical things we know about Lewis. We probably don't realize how much of a star he was 30 years before Hello Dolly and his position in bringing those, those, um, those, elements of music into American popular music. So that's also what we're going to unpack during all of this. So, so we got a lot to get to, but it's not as much as this sounds like. Um, start, starting off, first of all, we're just going to talk about jazz music and how jazz music came about. Now, we probably all, everybody in here probably knows some things already. And also, I want this to be really informal. So if any time you have anything that you'd like to add or comment on, feel free at any time. Um, what do we know about jazz? Where was it? Where is it from? New Orleans. Okay, jazz music starting in New Orleans. New Orleans, St. Louis, Kansas City, Chicago. Right, so it spread, spread to St. Louis, Kansas City, Chicago, Los Angeles, right? New Orleans spread. The music spread by ways of the train lines, as a lot of things did. Just like you hear stories about the blues traveling blues musicians that would hobo on a train and go somewhere. Wherever the train line went, that's where they went, and they got off sang a song on the street corner for a little while, had some experiences, wrote some new songs about whatever experiences they had, messed with some woman and got in trouble with the husband, wrote a song about it, ran out to town before the husband came and got him. That's a new song that they got. And then they go off and then at some point, somebody hears them singing this, singing, singing this song that has connections to a record company and says, man, I want to make a record of you doing that song right there. And that's how we have it. That's why we have those things captured after they went off and had all those experiences all over, those, all over the places. So the, the train lines took everybody where took the music along with the culture, wherever it was going. And so uh, it, it spread out to Los Angeles first and Chicago first from New Orleans. But it was started in New Orleans. And we're going to talk about the reason that it was started in New Orleans and why it couldn't have been started anywhere else. Now, the spread of it, of course, we have the explanation for. But why was it started in New Orleans? Anybody got any insight into that? Why it had to be New Orleans? New Orleans had a very uh, diverse <clears throat> culture. Uh -huh. uh, Right. I felt was the blending of Caribbean, African, uh, it was a, it was a that diverse culture allowed for the birth of the no, Very true. That's very true. It's a multicultural music. The formation of it, which we're going to get into, is one of the, it, it typifies one of the greatest lessons of the music and something that I try to embody in anything that I program, anything that I teach anybody, is the fact that when, when the music started, in the uptown section of New Orleans, amongst the black people that lived there, it was only there. When it was only there, nobody knew about it, and it was just kind of a local neighborhood thing, just like if somebody in your, if somebody in your neighborhood could cook real well, and only y'all know about it. 
That's, that's what jazz was like when it was there. It was still great, but it was only there. It wasn't until some things changed that brought a bunch of people together that had, had legally not been able to be together and everybody input into it and it became jazz music then. That's when it flourished. The greatest lesson in the music is that it's only great when people contribute to it, when everybody has a say in it. That's the way society should work. That's the way the world should work. That's the way business should work. That's the way our churches should work. That's the way everything should work. This is, this, this is a philosophy of jazz music that I believe in 100%. And the proof is in just how it was formed. So New Orleans was founded because the people were looking for, people were, of course, trying to, trying to conquer the new world, this being the new world. We're going to go back to our ninth grade history class real quick. And we know about the, about the conquerors, and we've heard the names in the Hernando de Soto and all of, the, all of these kind of conquistadors from the various countries that went all over the world from Europe and just squashed all the native peoples that were there, pillaged all of their resources, took it back to Spain or France or England or Portugal or wherever. And we all know those stories. So there was a, there was a uh, um, conquistador named Pizarro who conquered Peru. And so that was, it was, it was, he was doing it in the, in the name of Spain. It wasn't going well. He was kind of getting beat back pretty badly. And so they asked for uh, the help of a man named Hernando de Soto. De Soto came and helped him to conquer Peru. And because of that, they gave, uh, Spain gave de Soto the island of Cuba to be the ruler over the island of Cuba. Of Cuba. And so he was there for a while, but got bored. He was an action kind of person. He wanted to be on the front lines of things. So he, so he said that, uh, as we conquered people, you know, the thing that had happened, as, they, as anybody conquered anyone, they took not only their resources, but they took their knowledge. Same thing that we know that happened in North Africa uh, as, the, as the Greeks went to Alexandria and took the, took the resources of the black people that were living there, destroyed the libraries, but took all the books. We all know all, all these stories that happened. The same thing happened with these people, and there were writings and rumblings about, about, about ancient peoples that had sailed to the continent of North America, it wasn't called that then, of course, and had heard about this great river that, that divided the continent of North America or went deep into it. It hadn't been mapped out completely yet, but there was some big, huge river that they'd heard about. And it was just something, again, it was in rumblings and writings and things. So De Soto had heard about that, and he said, well, I want to go find that for Spain, go find this river for Spain, and of course, I'll claim it for us, and it'll be the Spanish thing, you know, and then, of course, you give me a piece of it, and we'll and put my name on it, let me pl plant my name on it for all history and all that whole thing. So. He started traveling and um, went all the way around Florida, where we know Florida, into the Gulf, went all the way around, past Alabama, and ends up finding the mouth of this river. And he travels it all, and if you know that geography at all, I know y'all know what I'm talking about already. You travel that geography, you go to a, you go, it snakes kind of like this before it goes straight. And he traces it all the way up to about Missouri. And he's, but you know, everywhere he goes, he's meeting resistance from the native people there. And he loses a few men, and then he gets back on the, on the river and goes up to the next place and, put, and uh, gets off the boat, hoping and these people are friendly, they're not, and loses a few more men. Now his numbers are dwindling down, so he gets as far as Missouri, he said, okay, that's enough. Let me just go back to Spain and tell them that I found it, and, uh, and just you know, see if I can see how, much, how many accolades I can get for the founding of it. So he does that, and he's heralded, and you know, that's why we know his name now. That's why they talk about his name in ninth grade history class now because he did, because he helped conquer the Incas and he helped to found this river, which we know as the what? Mississippi. The Mississippi River, right. So he helped to find the Mississippi River initially, but he didn't trace the whole thing. So for France, 100 years later, there's a guy named La Salle, and La Salle is scoping out what, a, a territory that they would control eventually, known as Canada, which would be known as Canada. And he finds the mouth of a great river up there. And of course, the rumblings, the writings and all that, he knows about De Soto, 100 years before, starts to connect the geography of it. This must be the same thing. I'm up here, and I heard that down here there's a river, and we're kind of in the same area of North America where it should be. He's putting two and two together. So he thinks that that's, he thinks it's the same thing, but he, he's encountering resistance, of course, from the natives up there. So he doesn't get to go all the way down here and trace it. So now we have these two people that have, that have kind of uh, mapped out part of it or no part of the story. And then you get to a man named Lemoyne. And Lemoyne is working for France, and now this now we're in the time of, of, uh, of in the 1700s when England has already laid claim to part of America, part of North America, and France is hoping to lay claim to a large portion of it. Everybody knows it's here now, so everybody's trying to get over here to get their, to put their flags down. So Lemoyne comes over and goes from France, does the whole same trip that De Soto and, 
and uh, LaSalle did, goes around Florida, gets into the Gulf, and it's a long journey, and he's having the same resistance every time he lands on a coast in Florida or something. He's losing people, battles, all kind of stuff, diseases, all kind of stuff is going on. So he gets to this bay, and he thinks, this must be it. He finds this bay. And so he plants his flag, the, plant, the, the flag of France down there, and he says, this must be that river that he's talking about. It's a bay, and there's a river that goes in. Turns out it's not. It's Mobile, Alabama. And it's the reason that Mobile is the only other place in America that has Mardi Gras, because it was initially a French colony, and he thought that that was the Mississippi River. Le Moyne did. So he keeps going. Once he realizes that's not it, he puts the French flag down, and he keeps going, and he initially, eventually finds um, the mouth, and he goes up until he gets to the crescent. And when he gets to this one bend that's like this in the river, he decides to plant the flag down there and establish a port, and that becomes New Orleans, 1716. So we have New Orleans right there. And of course, we are in the age of slavery in the 1700s. So everybody has slaves. Everybody's using slavery to develop their colonies. The French are very aware of the problems that the English are having in their colonies on the East Coast with all of the slave rebellions and things that are going on. They're very aware of things that are going on in the islands. Um, the, the Toussaint L'Overture uh, 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 revolution hasn't happened yet, but there are things leading up to it on the island which will become known as Haiti that, they, go, that you know, they can see the writing on the wall that, you know, just keeping our, necks, keeping our foot on the necks of these, of these Africans all the time is not really working out too well for these other countries. How can we have slavery but not have it be quite as restrictive as that? How can we make it work? Is there some middle ground? That's what the French were trying to figure out. That's what Le Moyne um, did figure out in a way in New Orleans. So what he decided was that seeing that what happened in, in, in the English colonies and Portuguese colonies, every other colony, is that when you were captured as a slave or brought over as a slave, you were stripped of everything African. You weren't allowed to speak your language. You weren't allowed to communicate in, communicate in any way that resembled anything in Africa. You couldn't wear your clothes. You were stripped of your religion. You were stripped of your complete identity. And all of that was supplanted, of course, with the identity of those who had captured you. So they said, well, we need to subjugate these people but we need to allow them to retain some form of their African identity in our new colony here in New Orleans. So let's figure out how we can do that. And so what they did is they established a place in New Orleans where one day a week, Africans could be Africans. One day a week, they could, they could go there, they could speak their languages, they could dance, they could sell wares and things that they'd made. They, could, they were off from work, of course, and this was on the, the uh, Christian Sabbath on Sunday, and they could go to this place and they could be African. And this became the only place in North America that was, a, that was a place of retention of African culture during the time of slavery. Y'all know the name of this place? Is it a place that you ever heard something like this before? You probably heard the name before. Maybe you didn't put it together that, that, that it, this is what it is. It's called Congo Square in New Orleans. It still exists in New Orleans. It's in a place called Louis Armstrong Park on, um, shoot, why am I forgetting the street? Iberville's on Iberville Street? I might be wrong on the street, but there's a, there's a huge park there called Louis Armstrong Park right next to, to the Treme section of New Orleans. And um, there's a big theater in there called the Mahalia Jackson Theater. And in there is the place where Congo Square was where the slaves used to meet on Sundays. And this was the place of African retention. And this is the reason why jazz music had to have started there. Because jazz music is a, is a hybrid music. It's a mixture of African African harmonic and rhythmic elements, European harmonic and rhythmic elements, also Native American uh, rhythmic and harmonic elements. And the Native American part of that is something that's not talked about a lot, but Native, of course, Native Americans populated all of North America. So everywhere Europeans went, they were there, and there was some kind of interaction between them and whoever was there, and whoever came and conquered that, part, that land. So Native Americans were slipping in and out of New Orleans and living in the, living in the, in the uh, in the bayou sections outside and coming back in and, and mingling with, the, with not only the slaves but also with the white people there, with the Europeans there, all throughout the history of it. So their culture is intertwined into the music also. So Congo Square is where all of this happened. And in Congo Square, it, is, it exists from 1724 to 1885. So you have a long period, you know, 161 years of it, of this happening, generations of people experiencing this. And you even have people that wrote about it 
that uh, there was a, 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 you know, in the newspapers back then, people used to travel and they would write about their travels back to their home readers. So there was a guy from Cincinnati who traveled to New Orleans in about 1890, 90 something. And he wrote back about this place called Congo Square where you could see these Africans dancing. This is after slavery has ended, but they were still getting together there. And they were still playing, they were still doing everything that they did up until almost the turn of the century, or the, the turn of the 1900s. So he went, in the 1890s, he went there and wrote about the fact that there were, that, that, uh, there were these people speaking these, for these very you know, funny languages, things I'd never heard before, doing dances I'd never seen before, playing wild music on instruments I'd never seen before, some traditional African, music, African instruments that they'd made and some of the, the, the instruments that they'd played, uh, um, European instruments that they'd come into contact with from being in America for so long. And so this is the place that sets the seed for jazz to be, for jazz to start. It's Congo Square and it's around the 1880s or so. There's no one date, you know, one particular date, but, there's, but this is when it all happens. And it's because you've had now at this point in 1880, over 100 years of this place operating um, as the center of African retention in America. Have y'all ever heard, can y'all know the name of the first jazz musician? You ever heard the name of this guy? They did a movie on him about 10 years ago. The first jazz musician. The first one that's credited, of course, you know, by everybody. Starts with a B. Is Scott Joplin? Nope. He's a pianist. Came out, he's came along a little later. Did he come with Dr. Jazz? He wrote Dr. Jazz. I can't think of his name right now. So he's a musical. Oh, you're thinking of no, you're thinking of Jelly Roll. Yeah. yeah Not yeah. Jelly Roll. Before Jelly Roll. He, you know, Jelly Roll said he was first. He said that, but <laughs> a lot of people said that. You know, when they thought he could make some money by saying it. A lot of them. There were a lot of people. There was a lot of interest. Once jazz music became commercial in the 1930s, some of the some of now now some of the people started to think, well, okay, where did it all start? And uh, as they asked some of the older uh, New Orleans musicians that were now living in New York City, those guys kept harking back to certain names and say, I think those guys are still down there. So those guys from the record companies and, the, and 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 some of the writers went back down to New Orleans and caught some of those guys in the 1930s that were in their 60s, 70s, and 80s and got some stories from them. But of course, all of them, now seeing that, that their younger uh, people that they had trained up are now in New York making a bunch of money, and now these guys are coming down here saying, you know, asking them about the, the start of it, the origins of it, all of them said that I invented, the jazz, I invented jazz music, that I was the one that started it. Five or six different people said it. When the truth is, not all of them were lying. You know? But the one that they all said started it was a guy named Buddy Bolden. That's the name you're thinking about, but they, they did a, a movie, movie called Bolden about, it came out about 10 years ago. No, no, actually it wasn't that long. Because when, when we moved it, it was about six years, five or six years ago, it was still running, about five or six years ago. I played on the soundtrack of it. And um, it's, uh, it was a good movie, it was kind of an art film. So for me, I know his story, so for me it was kind of a little too artistic for me. I wish they just told the story, it kind of, <laughs> But you know, if if you don't know the story, you probably would like it. For me, I didn't like it that much because it just was too, like Nightmare on Elm Street kind of, yeah. you know, flashbacks and, you know, this just a little too, very yeah, very eclectic. You know, it just wasn't my. But anyway, I'm not gonna get into that one. Um, so Buddy Bolden was the first recognized jazz musician. He was the guy that all those old guys said was started it all up. So with Buddy, what was the thing that he did? Now jazz music didn't sound like we know it today. It did not at all. Jazz music, of course, you go to hear a jazz band play, you expect to see, you know, three to, f three to six people on the stage, unless you've seen a big band, which is, you know, 15, 16, 17 people. And you expect to see them, hear them play, and they play a, they play a melody or something together, then they all solo. And then they all play a melody out, and that's the end of the song, right? That's what we all know as jazz music. Back then, there were no solos. The music was completely collective. And if you think about New Orleans music or New Orleans jazz as we kind of know it, it has, a, it has what we call collective improvisation. Now within that, it's very sophisticated. And it's so sophisticated, we don't even recognize how sophisticated it is because it works so well. Is that within all of that polyphony, which is which all these polyphonies, all these musical lines that are happening at the same time, you have a, usually have usually a, a trumpet player or cornet player you have a trombone player and you have a clarinet player and those are the wind instruments in the front line. And then you'll have either a string bass or a tuba playing the bass part. You'll have a drummer 
and you'll have either a banjo or guitar or, and or a piano, depending on the makeup of it. And that's kind of the standardized modern New Orleans jazz ensemble instrumentation. It wasn't like that back then. You actually could play it on, you could play jazz on anything you could play it on. You know, so there were plenty of accordions and violins and alto horns, things that we don't even see on anymore, antique kind of horns that all played jazz music. And you could see any combination of any of these things in any New Orleans band back in the 19 teens in New Orleans when they were playing the music. And so what was it that Buddy Bolden did? So first of all, the music was, collect was collective. But what was it that he did to make all of these guys say that he started it? He improvised. He improvised. He did. Was he writing anything down? He didn't. He, did, he, could, he wasn't a reading musician at all. That brings up my question. Yeah. Um, and um, comment because um, when, when I see um, the establishment people talk about music back then, and they would decry their children listening to it because they said that it's just noise because they can't hear what's going on because it's not, it doesn't follow principles of music. Right, so right. What, what's your comment on that? Because body, they didn't write anything down, so what did you do? Right. So it's just like, oh, good. Did he create structure? No, the structures were already there okay. because he was playing music that already existed. He wasn't a composer and he was playing music that was already around, songs that were already around in New Orleans, some, just some kind of colloquial kind of things that, that were there, others kind of spiritual, you know, re religious music. But he just had a band that was standard. Yeah, well, he had, he had a band he played with, but again, you know, bands were mixed instrumentation. You know, but what was it that he did? He had his name on a marquee. You know, so, so it's, it's, it's the difference between Think about, what's your favorite place to eat? Chipotle. Chipotle, right? Chipotle makes, they, I like Chipotle too, so they make like some real good food. Okay. You ever ate a Taco Bell? Okay. Taco Bell's not your favorite place to eat, is it? No. Okay. Now, what's it about Chipotle that makes it different? Um, makes you like it so much? You have to meet. So now they, they have options. They cater to what it is that you like. They have options for what you like there. You know. Also, it's it's you, you, you can see everything right there. It's fresh, right? It's fresh. So it's all seat, sitting right there. Nice shiny silver steam table. You know, right there. You can see everything being made in front of you. They're giving you something that you that you desire, and you can and you can see how it how it's done, in a way that's different from when you go to Taco Bell. Taco Bell seems, and I hope you know, I don't want y'all get in trouble for me talking about Taco Bell on camera. <laughs> but uh, and think about the copyrights and all that, you know, the legal troubles. You I'm just, see. you know, all right. So you go to Taco Bell. Now I don't even eat at Taco Bell anymore. I used to work at Taco Bell when I was in high school when it was actually good. I don't, I, that's why I don't eat it now. But that's that's another two hours. But um, you go to Taco Bell. Okay, you got all this kind of pre-made stuff, pre-made meat mixtures, things they put in. It doesn't have the same feeling. Doesn't, have to, doesn't make you feel the same way when you eat it. When you look at it, it doesn't make you feel the same way. So I know when you eat it, it makes you feel even worse. Whereas when you look at what's there at Chipotle, you can see, you can, you can look at it and start to taste it. You can see how they're making it and they're catering to what you, what do you want? You want some sour cream? You want some of this? You want some of that? You want some of that? You know, you can just feel, there's a feeling to the way that, that the food feels there. You can, you can apply this to any kind of, any person that cooks well. And I'm, I, I'm a foodie, so I can, you know, I, I agree with this analogy. Somebody that really can cook and make something for you, especially if they're making it for you, it's going to have a feeling to it that's much different from anything that you'll just get some, that somebody makes for a thousand people anywhere. It's a feeling just to your auntie or your grandmama or somebody cooking for you or somebody that's a good friend of the family cooking for you. Y'all were just talking about Escovitch fish and all that. I'm just, when, somebody make, when, when somebody does that and like they really know what they're doing and they're doing it for you because they want you to enjoy it, there's a feeling to it. Feeling is the most important thing in, every, in anything that you can give somebody, whatever that is, a present, a, a hug, a handshake, a greeting, or a piece of music. Feeling is the most important thing, and that's the thing that Buddy Bolden had. He was playing music that already existed, but it was the way he played it. The feeling that he put into it, using, thing, using, using devices that sounded vocal and sounded like people 
playing, people singing instead of somebody just playing a trumpet in the established European kind of military way that, that we had established playing wind instruments in America. Going through, you know, from John Philip Sousa and all of that, you know, from going back into the 1800s and orchestral music, which comes from Europe, all of that stuff. This was the, was, this was the real revelation in jazz music, was the feeling that he was putting into songs that were already known. So he wasn't composing stuff. So he was playing stuff that was already around in a different way. And the way he played it made everybody recognize it and want to come to it. They say that he would get and he would put his he would, he would put his band at any time on a horse-drawn buggy and they go out to this park in New Orleans. And on the way, he would just take his horn out and just play a play a couple of notes of a song. And it said it'd be like, you know, you seen like those, you seen like the Pied Piper bringing the bringing the people around. He said the people would just come out of their houses and just follow him all the way to this park for them to give a concert, just on hearing the feeling that he put into those few notes when he played. That he could call, they would call it, they, they, they would call it calling my children home. And there was, a, there was a Creole band leader there, we didn't talk about Creoles and all that yet, but there was a Creole band leader in New Orleans named John Robichaud, who was doing, and he's in that movie too, he's in, he's in Bolden, that was like, the, that he had the, he had the best, um, the best non-jazz band in town. Played a lot of gigs, made a lot of money. He, he was very prominent there, and he said that Buddy, he he actually he loved Buddy Bowden, but hated him because Buddy could call all his customers away from him in the middle of a meal at a nice restaurant. When they heard him playing, going down the street this way, and the restaurants over here, they'd all gotta go, go and follow Buddy Bowden, and Buddy would go go wherever Buddy's set up in this park, and Buddy's band would give a con would give a, a concert or a performance there. It's the feeling that was in the music, and that's the thing we're going to get into with Louis Armstrong. I know you're going to get to this, but it's killing me. Huh? How did the name come up? Which name? Jazz. Oh, jazz, okay. Jazz was a name, was a word that was already in, in existence in America when the music came around. Now, there are a lot of, there are a lot of stories that you're going to hear. You're going to hear about um, jazz music being, of course, the, the lowest ones, of course, the ones that were written by those that owned the periodicals when they were trying to, to downplay jazz music. They're going to say, Jazz music was only played in like places of ill repute, and that you and that jazz was a shortened word for the jasmine perfume that the women of the night would would wear, and so J A S S, as it was originally spelled on record at least, meant was was a shortened version of jasmine for that fragrance that they wore. The truth is that not only not, not that is true, they did play in places like that, but that's not where the name came from. The name was already in existence in American slang, as meaning something extra. And there's a, good, uh, there's a good article from a baseball game in San Francisco in 1880-something where the guy, where the, the commentator says, that he, the, the pitcher threw a really good game, and the commentator wrote down, that guy really put some jazz on the pill, meaning the pill being the baseball and jazz being the way that he pitched that game. That guy really put some jazz on the pill is what he wrote down in 1880-something. So that lets you know that it was already in practice in slang, meaning something extra. He did something extra with that ball. And so this is what jazz was doing. It was doing something extra to music that was already here, that was already written. Because until we get to the guy that you were talking about, Jelly Roll Morton, we don't have a composer in jazz music. And he's really, of Je Jelly Roll is of the second generation of jazz musicians. Buddy Bolden being the first one coming to prominence in the 1890s and playing up until about 1906. He was committed to an insane asylum around 1906. And he died in the insane asylum in 37 or 30 something. But, um, but none of those guys, they were all ear players. They all played by ear. They didn't read music, most of them. Some of them did. But, um, but uh, they were mainly ear players, not composers. So they were reinterpreting in a jazz style things that were already around. But that actually helped the music because people that knew it for its very strict way of being played could hear the innovation in it in the variations and the embellishments that they put into them. And that's part of what we're going to talk about going on, get all the way, getting all the way to Tyrese and anything going on today. You about to say? Uh-huh. But I know in the, in the 60s, 70s, 1860s, 70s, mm -hmm. there was a lot of jazz music that was being played in the Caribbean. Right. Right. Which is kind of like pre rag time. Right. Not really rag, but moving toward it. Um, and that also has influences from jazz. Right. From the earlier jazz, correct? Well, not of jazz music, because they wouldn't, they wouldn't, unless they were in New Orleans, they wouldn't have heard it. Yeah, but they would travel around. 
But and so, but I think what's happening is that they were figuring it out. It, it wasn't. It was pre. It wasn't. It wasn't jazz yet. But there's there's not just what's going on in New Orleans. The people traveling through. Right. The traveling musicians that were in, you know national and international. So. Right. And so while they're playing from from a classical style, even though they're improv, improv improvising and playing by ear. Right. Right. Blind Boom was blind. Right. Right. He's working with some improvisatory styles, but it's not quite jazz yet. Right. And jazz is going on and, and really starting to uh, take root in New Orleans. Right. So. Right. No, you're right. There's improvisation in the world of music. It's just not jazz improvisation. It's the same thing that, that goes on today. It's the same thing that happens with people misnomer. A lot of things is calling it jazz music that's not jazz. There's a lot, just because someone improvises or makes or plays a solo doesn't make it jazz. Even today, but actually especially today, when somebody improvises just because they take out a saxophone and play a solo over with two or three other musicians, that doesn't make it jazz music. You know, if it doesn't have something, some, first of all, if there's not any type of interaction between the piano, bass, drums, or rhythm section, guitar, whatever, whoever's back there playing with them, if there's not some type of interaction there um, but, and coherence between what the soloist is playing and their playing, you know, it can't be jazz music. Because jazz, in its essence, is about that communication that happens between those that are in the accompaniment and those that are playing the solo. So you can't have jazz if there's a drum loop. There's no, that automatically cancels anything from being jazz music. So, well, we can get into this one too for a long time. But, as far as like ragtime and pre-ragtime music, the variations that they were doing, a lot of times they had two or three sets of them and it was, they stuck to only those. Only like Scott Joplin was, he was one of the only ones that actually could vary, vary it more than those two or three times. Boone was, but, but Boone only, but from what I read about Boone, he didn't have as much variation as, as, as what Joplin was doing. Yeah, more, actually Boone was probably, I'm, I'm a Boone scholar. Uh -huh. Boone was probably the other, Blind Tom. Blind Tom, yeah. Boone could improvise better than Blind Tom. He actually beat him out in competition. And Blind Tom wouldn't compete against him again. So <laughs> Boone nice. was doing some things improvisatorily that people were not able to do. He was that virtuosic in his, in his um, accompaniments. And he, he, but he considered himself a classical musician. Right. Though he could improvise and he could play anything that he heard one time. Right. And, right. and was known for that all across the United States, into Canada, um, Iowa, Indiana, going into the uh, Northeast. And there's, we haven't proven in news reports yet, but um, there's uh, one article that says that he was in Europe, but I don't see anything in Europe right. that says that he was in Europe. Right. But there was, um, his manager that said that he was in Europe. See, the heart, I sing his music. Huh? I sing his music. The hard, the, the, the hard part in improving the case is that he didn't make any piano rolls, did he? He did make piano rolls. He did, Boone made piano yeah, rolls? Are, are his piano rolls comparing them to Joplin's? No. no. Um, I, are they, I, have so. I have copies of his piano rolls. Well, all. Joplin wrote his stuff down. So huh? Boone didn't write his because he was blind. Right, right. But I have, I have the recordings of uh, the existing rolls of, of blind rolls. No, so, so I'm, I'm, so I'm comparing his piano rolls to Joplin's piano right. rolls, because that's kind of like the, where, the, where we have. When Blondheim went in to record his uh, uh, performance of Manassas, uh -huh. the Storm of Manassas, he blew the machine. Right. Right. And that's what he did. He blew the machine. Right. And so he was able to improvise better than Joplin did. Right. And that's why Joplin was able to improvise better than Joplin. So Boom was able to improvise better than Joplin. Right. And that's why Joplin was able to improvise better than Joplin. Right. And that's why Joplin was able to improvise better than Joplin. Right. And that's why Joplin was able to improvise better than Joplin. Right. And that's why Joplin was able to improvise better than Joplin. Right. And that's why Joplin was able to improvise better than Joplin. Right. And that's why Joplin was able to improvise better than Joplin. Right. And the thing, the, thing about, the thing about Joplin is that you have, in a lot of what he did, because it was a little later, four or five takes of the same songs, each one of them would have a different variation of them. So you have, so the amount of material that, that Joplin presented on piano rolls and some of those cylinders that, that, that they, they found later on, each one would be completely different. And I hadn't heard that Boone's variations were as expansive as Joplin's. I know he could do a lot, but, but Joplin just has so many different things that yeah, ways that he could approach it, you know. In looking at Boone's music, the uh -huh. rhythm music, he changes within the structure of his piece. Okay. His, his, his uh, syncopations vary within the structure of the piece, so they're kind of difficult, they're difficult to play. Got gotcha. you, got gotcha. you. I like to check them out. Yeah. I like to check them out. So the one thing that we didn't talk about really quickly in New Orleans is the people that were there. 
is that when, when New Orleans was when New Orleans was founded and was established, you had three classes of people, or three types of people that established themselves. Of course, you had the Europeans, and it was founded by the French, but it also was controlled by the Spanish for about 40, 30 years, 30 or 40 years, and then went back to the French. But then you also have um, the African slaves, or the descendants of the African slaves by the time jazz music is coming around. But then you also have the Creoles. And we, we, know, we know the word Creole, it kind of universally applies to a lot of different things, but Creoles were basically the results of the liaisons between the, the Africans and the Europeans. A lighter skin class of people um, sometimes look comp sometimes almost devoid of any African feature, but a lot of times there was something there that everybody could see. And in New Orleans, they were so attuned to it, they could just look at someone's nose and say, okay, he must be Creole, even though his skin might be just as light as uh, an, an European person. And so you had them, and the Creoles were, were, because they were the descendants of Europeans, they were afforded a higher station in society. So they were a lot of times set up in a different part of time, town. Um, sometimes, sometimes, this is really messed up, but sometimes Creole men would have a separate, you know, have a, I mean, Europeans would have a, a, a European household, and then on another side of town, a Creole household, was they, they, they'd, uh, had some type of life with this, with an African or, or freed woman, freed them, set them up over here with their Creole children in another part of town. And the European, the European wife probably doesn't know, but then again, they probably do know. They just deal with it and just let it, you know, let it go. That was all kind of part of society back then. But because those kids were Creole, they were educated like Europeans. And that trickled down into to music also, that they were given the best music education. Sometimes they were even sent to France to learn and come back to New Orleans. And most of the time, um, if they played wind instruments, they played clarinet. Clarinet is a French instrument. And it's the reason that when you listen to early New Orleans music, the clarinet parts are usually the most well-executed parts because they had the best education. And they were the ones that normally could read music, either them or the violinists. So when you had a New Orleans band that had that mixed instrumentation, the violinists, a lot of times if a new song would come out, the violinists and the clarinetists would be the ones that would teach it to everyone else that couldn't read music. And then they learn the song, everybody get their part down, then they start to add the jazz to it and vary the part and add embellishments on all the parts and figure out the whole collective thing. And so they had that dynamic going on the entire time. And it's just, uh, it, was, it, it set the stage for it all. But the, the thing that, that broke it all down was a, a decision, a court decision called Plessy versus Ferguson that we've all probably heard about. And in Plessy versus Ferguson, the aftermath of it, the aftermath of it, took away the restrictions between Creoles and darker-skinned Africans that were there. It actually lumped them together socially. So now they were living, after, after a period of time, they were living in the same areas of town. They were able, able to play in the same clubs where all that was segregated before. They were able to play together. So now you have the Europeans, the Creoles, and the black people playing together, music together in the same part, in, all in the same establishments. Um, they, had a, they had an area of New, of New Orleans called Storyville which was basically the area where you, anything could happen. They, they said, if you're going to do all this stuff, you know, everything that was going on in New Orleans, you know about New Orleans' reputation. Everything, they, it was so bad that they decided to just give it a district in the city. And this alderman named Sidney Story came up with the idea, said, okay, this is going to be called Storyville, and anything y'all want to do, you can do it here. And just keep it out of the rest of the city. And so that's where, that's where it happened, and that's where a lot of jazz musicians ended up playing. Jelly Roll Morton being one of them, a lot of, these, a lot of these houses of ill repute would hire a piano player to go and play to entertain all the customers while everything's going on in there. And of course, what you're supposed to do, you're supposed to put the piano player with his face in the wall so he can't see what's going on on all the couches and back in the back. So they put them together like this. But, but of course, Jelly Roll was, was, always, was always real slick. He'd get a big bottle of beer, big glass mug of beer, so he could see the reflection and put it right there on the piano so you can see the reflection of what's going on on the piano. And he would play, a lot of those guys would play in these places all night, and they made a good living just playing there. Then on the after hours, they'd go to a saloon somewhere, and all the pianos, piano players would go there and battle it out. They'd have all these jam sessions and cutting contests. And so um, after, Plessy versus, after Plessy versus Ferguson happened, that's when you had uh, everybody getting together. And that's when the music really flourished. And that was, that was when you started to have the migration that we talked about when the music started to spread out a little bit. So I want to play something here because it's going to give us an idea of this kind of unifying aspect of the music, something that was in the music. And now this is, this is going to be centered around 
a rhythm that y'all know. Y'all have heard your whole life. Um, even if you don't know it, you know it. It's a rhythm that goes like this. Okay, now this rhythm is called the Tresillo rhythm. Um, the bass part that goes along with it is called the Habanera rhythm, but the rhythm is called the Tresillo. And it's, a, it's an African rhythm that is, permeates uh, all of the, uh, the diasporic communities, especially in the Caribbean, Spanish speaking and, Af and English speaking. All through salsa music, all through Haitian music, all through Man, it's every music that you can think of is, is there. So I'm going to play a couple of examples of it. But the first one is going to be the earliest one of it. This is Jelly Roll Morton. And he's playing a song, his, a song that he composed called New Orleans Joys. And I want you to listen to what happens in the left hand, the bottom part of it. You know, so you hear the melody, of course, as piano players play in the right hand. But listen to where the rhythm that he goes into in the left hand. I hope everybody can hear this okay. I'm sorry, hold on. Okay, so I'll stop it. I'll stop it right there. That's the other example, kind of spilling over into that one. So I'll stop it right there. Does everybody hear it though? Boom, ding, boom, ding, ding. Now, if I speed it up, you're going to really know it. Mm. You're gonna hear it all New Orleans music. You hear it all over the place. And I'm gonna play another example. This is Scott Joplin, uh, one that he wrote called Solus. And uh, it's called, he calls it a Mexican serenade, although they really didn't play this in Mexico. But I think he just did that to sell some records. Called it that to sell some records. So you can hear it in the left hand, the bottom part of what he's playing. Okay. So you can hear it there. Now I'm going to bring you a little bit closer to home, because I'm sure y'all have probably heard this one before. Well, yeah, he was from Texas, Canada. But that's why he was serving it to the Mexicans. <laughs> right? Right? Okay. So now, this is one y'all have probably heard, a band called The Meters. Mm-hmm. 
I hate to cut that off, but you know. Y'all heard that song before? Hey, Pocky Way? Now I'm going to go even further. I'm going to go up to a song that y'all may have heard in a little more recent times. Same rhythm. I could give a hundred examples. It's all over the place in popular music and jazz music and Latin music, everywhere. So the Tresio rhythm, when you're going to hear countless variations on, okay? So it's important to know that that's there from the beginning because scaling it back to now 1920s or so, so now you have all of these innovations going on in New Orleans. You know, now by 1920, you have, you know, Buddy Bolden has already played, he's already, he's, he's already locked up, but he's already taught a lot of people through his brilliance, you know, what jazz music should feel like and sound like. And he has disciples now, the second generation or so that's already come up. And they're now the, the, uh, the kind of established musicians, people like King Oliver and Manuel Perez and other people like that. They're like the second generation of musicians um, in New Orleans that are carrying on what jazz music is. And they're, they're the ones that are teaching people like young Louis Armstrong, who was 17, 18 years old in, during these times, you know. So they're the ones that are showing all of Lewis's contemporaries how to play jazz music. And um, they're also the ones, the first ones to start to spread, uh, are the second generation. Kid Ory goes out to Los Angeles, King Oliver goes to Chicago, Red Allen, who was Lewis's only real competitor of his generation, goes to New York before Lewis, gets there before Lewis. Um, and so all of these things are happening, but jazz music is still contained basically in New Orleans. And it's just, it goes along, this is going to just go along with this kind of basic idea that what good is it to have something great if nobody knows about it? And this is the problem with jazz music at the time. You had to have somebody, and first of all, of course, the, the origins of it are black. Everybody knows that. Now, the records are already being made. The first jazz record was the original Dixieland Jazz Band in 1917. Um, the... Uh, Funny quick story. The actually the first jet, that was an all white band from New Orleans, the original Dixieland Jazz Band that made that first record. The opportunity to make the first jazz record was given to a Creole band, Creole and mixed African American band called the original Creole Band a year before that. But they turned it down. Is that uh you know the way musicians the way musicians think you know when you play, you're supposed to get paid. You know just what it is, especially back then. Recording was very new back then. So recording technology, the way they had to record back then is that uh, you were in a room with a big horn that came out of the wall and it captured the, captured the sound and it was attached to this machine called a transcription lathe on the other side of the wall that had a million knobs and it would take down the sounds that happened in this side of the wall and take them and, 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 and transcribe them onto this disc. Then they then make, the, make the disc uh, have a metal coating. They do this metallurgy process, make it have a metal coating. Then they would press that to press other records. And that's how they recorded back then. But in order to do all of that, this machine is really, really sensitive, especially to volume, volume and low frequencies. So they bring everybody in, and they'd mark off, depending on how loud you played or how big your sound was and how, how, what the likelihood was that it was going to mess up this machine, they would mark with tape or paint or something on the floor where you're supposed to stand in relation to this horn. So if the horn is there, the softest musician would be closest to it. The loudest musician would be the furthest away. And there's stories of Louis Armstrong. They say he played with such a big sound, big sound that he'd be way back in the corner somewhere. And his wife, who played piano, would say he'd be looking so lonely in the corner. And the whole band is up here, and he's way back in the back because he couldn't help but play so with such a big sound. So the Creole band, in order, to, in order to make this record, which was new then, the idea of recording was new then, they would have had to come into the studio the day before, get all their places marked, and then come back and make the record the next day. But they weren't going to get paid for the day to come in and figure out their spots. 
And of course, musicians mind, if I come in and play, I gotta get paid. So they were, they, the, the record company wouldn't pay them for that setup day, so they declined the offer. And then the original Creole jazz band on a tour of, of vaudeville circuits ends up getting into New York City and making up the first jazz record a year later. A white band from New Orleans ends up making the first jazz record. But they were great, they were a great band nonetheless, but it would have been great to get a chance to hear, um, hear the, a band made up of African Americans playing the first jazz record, you know, to hear what they sounded like. Because we don't really, we don't have, a, there are no records of them playing from that period. All of those musicians, after they broke up, made records later, but they go older and they weren't playing the same. So we don't know what the original Creole band actually sounded like. They would have been the most authentic representation of what African Americans playing jazz music from New Orleans would have sounded like if they'd done it. So, but the whole thing, the whole idea is that, you know, idea is, is, is only as great as who can hear it is the fact that you had to have someone that was gonna bring it to the masses. Because the music was black in origin already, everybody, you know, every, the, 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 most people were down on it. And there was even a term that, that has, I mean, this, this, this extended up until I was in college. I maybe just recently kind of fell out of favor just for political correctness. But they used to call, you know, all orchestral music, they call it legit music. It was a term, everybody would say legit. It was, man, it just rolled off the tongue. So easy, man. Oh, I got to, you know, we, yeah, we're going to check, check out this legit concert tonight. Everybody will say stuff like that. Legit concert. That means that you are a reading musician playing European orchestral music. So, of course, on the flip side, using the old Nation of Islam analogy, that makes jazz music illegitimate, you know? And that was how it was, that's how that word worked all through until, you know, 2000 or so. People were saying this. Legit music was this. That means that, you know, even though backhanded wise, jazz music must be kind of illegitimate. And that's what people thought of it. You didn't have to read music necessarily because we're talking about New Orleans collective improvisation. Um, mostly black, but all, at that point, only black people were the, were the greatest players of it. There weren't yet any great white players yet, 1917, 18. It wasn't until Bix Beiderbeck came along in the early 1920s as the, great, as the greatest, him and a, a saxophonist named Frank Trumbauer were the two first great white jazz musicians that they had. And uh, they had both learned a lot from Louis Armstrong's records and style and came up with their own styles based off of it. So they were very innovative. But, but um, it was just, the music was just, just in such a low place in the perception of America. So much that if, if, um, if you wanted to buy a record, wealthy people especially would do this. You know, we're talking seven, I should have, I don't have any with me, but we're talking 78 RPM records, you know, that have two songs per record, one per side. Each record company would have, let's say the record company is you know, RCA Victor. They would have different color labels to designate different types of, of recordings that were on each label. So say speeches would, be, uh, speech, speeches would be a green and gold label. Their colors were black and gold, but say speeches were a green and gold label. And say that religious music would be a yellow and, yellow and black label or something like that. You know, they had a color coding. And so the jazz labels, most of the time, each record company had what they called race records. Race records, of course, was a code word for jazz music, for anything made by black people. So they had their race series, and, their, and race series had their own designated number, catalog number, and label. The Brunswick race series was 7,000. So anything that had 7,000 on it were black people. And so if you walked in, and the record companies, record stores would have all these records sitting up there, and you pulled the thing out of the shelf, and you saw that color label that meant jazz music, that was taboo. So a lot of times, rich people would send their drivers in to go get the records, and put it under their overcoat walking out because they didn't want anybody to see them with these jazz records because they're bringing black people's music into their houses. You know, it was a very, it, it was, it, it, that might seem over the top, but that was a real thing. And that perception, I mean, went on all through the 1920s, all through these times. So the fact is that they also tried to crown, and these people were great musicians, but they weren't originators of the music. They also tried to crown a lot of different white people as the kings of the music. Paul Whiteman, king of jazz. Benny Goodman later, the king of swing. There were all these white people that they tried to crown as the, as the, the, you know, the, the greatest purveyors of the music in the 1920s. When the, when the public, the real jazz listening and buying public really knew, white and black, and they didn't care. The jazz audience did not care about white or black. Their, their integrated record sessions, you know, from the days, again, 78 RPM records, you can't see any faces on them. So they don't know who's on the record, but there are plenty of integrated record sessions, there are integrated jam sessions, Jazz music is bringing people together in ways that the, the country is not ready for in the 1920s. It was actually, jazz music was the first vision of integration on stage that America got. It was the very first view. 
Jazz music had an integrated stage 17 years before Jackie Robinson played baseball. Benny Goodman actually had the first integrated band. So, and Benny Goodman was as big as Beyonce today, like Benny in the 1930s. So him having an integrated stage, he was showing an integrated stage to millions of people. And it was the first time that that happened. So before Jackie Robinson did it with the Brooklyn Dodgers. So, so um, you know, fighting these moors was, was really, it was a big thing with jazz music, but it had to be done really in a calculated manner. And it was done in a very calculated manner. But in order to start all of that, you had to have some, you had to have a face of it. You had to have somebody that could push those ideals across, just like we were talking about LeBron earlier. You had to have somebody that could push the idea of that across. There had to be somebody that, first of all, could, could, could represent the music in the greatest manner. Had to be a complete virtuoso of the music, understanding all of it. Had to have the appeal of every, of, of uh, a universal appeal. Um, and also had to be able to cover all of the types of music that were out there now, that were out there at the time, at least in the 1920s. And you got to think also is that black people, black artists in the 1920s, they were stereotyped into only being able to record novelty tunes, blues tunes, things that they thought the black audiences would buy. And there was no idea of selling black music on a wide scale to white audiences. So all of the Tin Pan Alley songs, the love songs, all those kind of things that were, that were coming out then and that were written in beautiful music, you know, Gershwin and, and all these people, Isham Jones and all these people that are writing these beautiful songs all through the 1920s that are love songs being sung on Broadway stages and all of that. Black people were not recording any of those music. Bessie Smith was recording blues. Mamie Smith's recording blues. Um, Louis Armstrong is recording in the 20s blues and novelty tunes like King of the Zulus and things like that. In fact, I'll, I'll play that for you just so you can get an idea of what he was doing before he got a chance to do that. Thank you. 
don't know if you can hear all of that kind of banter that's going on, but I'm playing that for a couple of reasons, not only just to demonstrate like his, his extreme virtuosity, the way that he played, but this is an idea of a novelty tune. You had to have some kind of skit or some kind of little funny banter or something going on. That was one of the, they, they're supposedly in New Orleans, and uh, this is the King of the Zulus references, references the, the uh, Mardi Gras parade, the Zulu nation in the Mardi Gras parade. And, they, uh, and um, supposedly somebody from Jamaica comes up and says, and, uh, says that I hear that somebody's cooking chitlins around here. And uh, he said, they call them, y'all call them chitlins. He says, in my country, we call them an inner tube. And he said, I said, give me a pot of that. And then Lil, Lil Hardin is the piano player that's also Lewis's wife. And she says back in the back, everybody goes crazy for my children. And then she starts playing again, and then Lewis plays a solo. And so you had to have some kind of little funny thing in there. That would have been, that would have broke people up in the 1920s. So you had to have some kind of funny thing in there. But this is what, not that, not that Lewis minded doing that. He loved to be a showman. But black artists had to do stuff like this. They had, when, when there were also songs that had emotional content and different types of holds on, on American um, society, you know, we, we, we're talking about the 20s. We haven't talked about what's going on in America at the time. World War I in, 19, you know, in 1917, um, the Mexican-American War that happens in the 20s, build up into World War II coming up. All this stuff happens. People are writing music, creating art that, that, that reflects America's feelings about all of this stuff patriotic songs, songs of relief in those years after World War I, um, love songs that are meant to get people together to think about you know, f having families and getting married and, and, and all of that in the years after that. Then songs of, of mourning uh, when somebody has to go back off to war and, get, and something happens to them or they come back hurt or that kind of thing. Um, just all of this stuff is going on. Black artists aren't allowed to record that kind of stuff. They don't have no part of that. And that was all reserved for only the great, for the greatest of, of the uh, white bands that were out there, people like Paul Whiteman and those that were, that, were, that were at the top of the pop charts in the 1920s. It wasn't until Louis Armstrong came along and he was under the management of a person named Tommy Rockwell, who was shady in his own way. And, uh, but Tommy Rockwell was the first one to push him and insist to the record companies that Louis Armstrong is a genius and that he should be allowed to record the same type of material as anybody else. And it was then that he started to have appeal outside of, the, outside of just either the insider jazz market or just the black audience that bought his records. Those two, were the, those two were the demographics that bought most of the records up until he started to do, to, to do some of these other kind of songs we're talking about. And that's why Lewis was our first crossover artist. He was the very first crossover artist that we had in America. And I, now, every, you're supposed, you have to be a crossover artist now. It's, all the lines are so blurred in today's music that it's just, it's, it's just all in there now. But there was a time when it was a, it was a huge thing. Of course, that, you know, we all know the history of America, race relations in America. There was a huge thing in the entertainment industry in black artists being marketed to black people with black material, white artists being marketed to white people with white material. Then there was a, there was, then there was a period of black, black artists that made a, a popular song that really sold a lot of records in the black community, every white artist doing their version of it, most of the time ripping, off, ripping it off and taking the publishing or taking the, the, the royalties and publishing for it and doing their own version. We all know about Big Mama Thornton and Hound Dog and Elvis Presley and all that kind of stuff. So um, that, whole, that whole thing happened for a while. Then you just started having it all just kind of merging together where there, was no, there were no separate lines of anything. White people were doing black music, black people were doing white music, everybody was just doing music. But isn't it true though that we blame the, the, the artists for ripping the music off when it was the, the managers and all those people who were doing the ripping off because those, even some of those artists that made the songs popular, um, they benefited from it um, for fame, but the funds didn't come to them the same way that it went to the people who were in charge? Some of them, sometimes. Most of the time, you're right. Some artists got the royalties for those things. So, so in, in some of the records, you'll see the names of the artists uh, and underneath the title as the, as the, the, the composer of it. When the, the, their management could have arranged to go buy it from the, the black composer 
for some $50 or some menial amount, you know, sign this and here's $50 and thank you, you know, that kind of thing. So that happened a lot. Most of the time, you're right, it was not the artists, the white artists that got the royalties from it, most of the time. But there are some instances where they benefited a lot from that because they knew, they understood, they were composers themselves. And those artists sometimes knew that, okay, if I can get my hands on the publishing to this song, black people knew nothing about publishing, weren't taught that at all in early days of, of music. And so uh, um, a lot of times those white artists just got control of it. And that's, and that's just how it went. And they still have control of it, a lot of them, you know. So the one, the, let me see, I was gonna show you this, but I'll just, I'm, I'm not gonna show you the video. I'll just tell you that also that was one thing that was still around, that, that black artists had to face the idea of, of all of these vestiges from very early, early on, like post-Civil War era things, still going into the 1920s, things like blackface. Like blackface is something that we, you know, we don't see that often now. You see it every once in a while. I hear about somebody finding a picture from somebody in college at some, you know, some scandal or something. But it was a very real thing back then. And uh, it, all the way into the 1940s, you had white artists, mainstream white artists doing movies in blackface into the 1940s. Um, and it was something that was accepted. There's a clip, uh, there's a clip here, Man, I'll just show you a little bit of it. And this one is really kind of revealing because, well, there is, there is that, there's that too. There's a lot of times that uh, there's, there's some, well, minstrelsy was segregated. You had black minstrelsy and white minstrelsy. White was the first minstrelsy. And then white, that, was, that was white people in blackface imitating black people. And then somewhere along the line, the white people who put those things together, they decide, they, they said, well, shoot, the black people are doing it the most authentically anyway. Let's get them on stage, but let's put them in blackface too, which is, you know, you can get the idea of that. So you had black minstrelsy going on too. That didn't last as long, but white minstrelsy kept going on. Murph morphed into vaudeville as radio came along in like the 19 teens or so, and you had radio shows with different types of variety, things that became, became called vaudeville. And then, uh, um, and within all of that, when, when, once you started to have television and motion pictures, you had blackface. You had the images of things that had been going on since the end of the Civil War, now happening in the 1920s and 30s when films and, and later in the 30s when television comes along and all of that. And so in this one, in this clip, I'm just gonna show you just a little bit of it. This is from 1942. And this is Bing Crosby performing in blackface. And the whole band is in blackface too. They're all white, everybody's white. But the whole band is in blackface also. You see the bands in kind of plantation attire, you know. It's all very normal. These are the environments that black people had to come up in and try to create art within this environment, knowing that this was out there too. They still do an opera, yeah, that's right. That's right, they do. You know? And then the thing that's even a little more uh, like layered about this is that he and Louis Armstrong were great friends. Bing Crosby was the one that really brought Louis Armstrong into film. He had done one film before he met Bing Crosby, but Bing used to imitate Louis Armstrong on record all the time. And he, was, he used to come check him out when he was singing and playing and, uh, and got a lot of his style from Louis Armstrong. And then when Louis was in Hollywood in the 30s playing at, at a place called the Sebastian Club, um, he's the one that took him to the studios. He took Louis to the studios, introduced him to the directors and heads over there and started getting him film roles because of Bing Crosby. So one of Louis' you know, best friends also had to do movies in, black, in blackface. But he was not a racist person at all. It's just the norm of the time. And, uh, and, but, but black jazz musicians that might have had different feelings about something like that, they still had to create during these times. That's the point of what I'm saying, is that all of this is swirling around all through these times. This is 1942 when this happens. We've been talking about the 20s. So, so the, thing that's great, the thing that makes Louis Armstrong so prominent in all of this is that when he became the first crossover star, he brought all of that down-home culture that he had from New Orleans and in jazz music, he brought it to everyone. And everyone started imitating him. It's the first instance of white people imitating black culture, in black cult of young white people, that is, imitating black culture now in dress, in speech, 
and in other other elements elements of culture. Like he, would, you know, Louis Armstrong coined a lot of words that made it made its way into American slang, like words like cats, chops, pops, jive, scat, gut bucket. The word mellow to to talk about music or to talk about getting high because he was a marijuana smoker. He, Louis Armstrong was an avid marijuana smoker. And so uh, the word mellow, as opposed to anything in music or, or being high, uh, calling somebody daddy, you know, as a form of address. Louis Armstrong was the first one to do that and the first one to expose American culture to all of those words and a lot of other things. He was the first one to, mar to normalize, to somewhat normalize marijuana use, even though he was ostracized for it, even got arrested for it, you know, a lot, a lot of stuff. Hey, I'll tell you a real quick one. He, uh, in the 60s, he was coming, um, coming off of, of a flight, international flight into Washington, D.C., and he was meeting up with President Nixon. And uh, he had a suitcase with his, with his stuff in it. He had his weed in his suitcase. And he was walking, and President Nixon comes up right next to him, and he's walking. And he, of course, he got to go through some customs or whatever kind of check they have. So, he, so he's walking, and Nixon says, how you doing? He says, hey, Daddy, how you doing? Hold this for me. And they walk through the customs, knowing that nobody's going to check President Nixon's bag. <laughs> And as soon as they get past the cuss, he said, thank you, daddy. And he take his head go <laughs> along the way. So, so you know, Pops, he was something, boy. Pops was something. But he was the first great soloist, the first great crossover artist. And the thing that he did, and I want to just play these, 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 these two examples for you. The thing that he did and the way that he did it that made an impression on people is because, as we talked about, the music was disseminated through sheet music before. That's the way everyone learned how to play the music. They, people, were, people had a much... Uh, 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 a much larger portion or portion of the populace could read music, had pianos in their homes, and had some type of piano proficiency. So the new songs that came out in a Broadway show, or in a film, or that kind of thing, the sheet music would come out. They'd go to the local music store, get it, bring it home, and they'd start to practice it and learn it to whatever degree they were proficient on piano. But they'd learn it. And this is the way that people knew music. They knew music the way the composer intended. That's how they knew it. Lewis starts to make these records in 1928 and 1929 that were, were genius in their delivery. And it had to do with the fact that some of the records, some of the uh, heads of the record labels were, were, were worried that Lewis was doing so much variation and embellishment that people wouldn't be able to hear the melody. So what they did is they had their rangers, which are very important people in this whole story, the people that actually arranged the music for all these bands, they had them create arrangements that had both elements, that had the accompanying band playing the music straight while Lewis is playing the music with variation on top of it at the same time. And these were the things, the, the first records that pushed his genius out to the public because now you could hear it the way you knew it and you could hear it the way it been, had been being developed in 1928 for now for like 40 years, but they didn't know. Nobody really knew. So I want to play these two things for you. Um, I'll play a little bit of the first one. This is a song, you probably heard it, it's a standard called I Can't Give You Anything But Love. And uh, everybody's played this. But the first one I'm gonna play for you, this is a, 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 the bands were classified back then by either being called a sweet band or a hot band. A sweet band was one that played very straight, um, not much embellishment, or if anything sounded embellished, it was actually written out to, to sound like jazz music, but it wasn't actually improvised. And they played you know, bands like Guy Lombardo and those kind of things. There were a million of those, and those were the most best-selling bands that they had out there. They, they sold much more than the jazz bands that played the music that we kind of revere, Count Basie and Duke Ellington. Bands like this sold twice as many records as, as Duke and Count Basie, even though we think we always kind of revere Duke, for, Duke and all them for all their embellishments. So I'm going to play this record, which is an early recording of this song, I Can't Give You Anything But Love. Listen to how the melody is played, how it's very plainly stated and straight. Let me, go, let me get to where the number starts. I'll tell you, this is the verse before. It's going to start in just a second. Here it is. Happiness, 
I'd like to see you looking swell, baby. Diamond bracelets were worth dozen sell, baby. Till that lucky day, you know darn well, baby. I can give you Okay, so that's the whole melody to it. It goes into more of, more of the arrangement. But I'd like to play now, this, is, this was the first record that he did that demonstrated this. And this is Louis Armstrong's version. One year after that one, was, that was 1928, the first one I just played you. One year after that, he makes this record. And I want you to listen for how he interacts with the orchestration. The, mel the, the musicians in the back, they're playing the melody straight. Listen to all of the variations that he's doing when he's playing. This is what set the stage for, for everyone else to learn how to vary a melody. And it's the same thing that set the stage going all throughout the years into all of American popular music. They didn't know it was possible until they heard Louis Armstrong do it. How would they know? So here's the, here's, this is this one. Now check, check out how he does this. So the, the saxophones in the back are playing very straight. So they're, they're giving the public the song the way they know it. All of this jazz on top of it, that's the real innovation. And everybody recognized it because they knew those other versions that didn't have any of that in it. And then when Lewis starts singing, now you're really going to hear it. So now, that has, to, to somebody who knew the, the song the kind of straight way, and they heard that, they think he's just, they, first of all, they didn't like it at first. They thought he was just messing up all over the place. But after you examine it, you know, he doesn't even start the melody on the, 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 on the note that's written by the composer. If you listen to where it is in the very beginning. Okay. The melody goes da 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 da. That's the first note of the melody. He goes, I can't give you. Right, slides into it. You know, all of those kind of things, all of the phrasing that we call, that's what we call phrasing. Delaying, so delaying the delivery a little bit, sliding into notes, um, finding, knowing, well, I should say knowing, the correct alternate notes that you can sing, and being able to hear a melody within a different set of notes than the composer intended, all while you're improvising it. There are two or three other takes of this where he sings it completely different. And that's the thing about Lewis, is that he had, un, he had there was no limit to the amount of genius that he had. Nobody had ever heard anything like that. And on, on top of all of it, you can hear the melody the way the composer intended in the background. So you got both of, both of it working against each other. And that's the thing that really showed everybody what the music was like, what, it should, what, it, what the possibilities of jazz were. 
So I know we got we to gotta wrap it on up. So I just want to take it. I'm going to go back to where we started. Because I want you all to, to, to now listen to how the melody, we talk, started with this Tyree song, Sweet Lady, right? I want you to listen to what the melody actually is. And then listen to all of the, all of the uh, uh, embellishments that are, that are based, that are into the melody already in the way that he's doing it. Let me get past these ads here real quick. YouTube ads, all right? I'm gonna go to where he's singing. Okay. So now, even in that, like the first two phrases he sings, he sings, dee do dee dee dee, do do dee dee dee, dee do dee dee da. He sings those pretty straight, but now when he gets to the second part of it. Okay, so now, that one little run, little drop off he did. Just that little thing. It's something that nobody would have thought to do before a Louis Armstrong record, before he demonstrated it, because that wasn't the way it's written down in the sheet music. Like, again, all of this is just intertwined now in today's music, and it's just part of how we do things now. But, but we can go through this entire song or any song you could pick out. There's any song that has a melody that you could pick out and listen to the way that they sing it. Find, this, find the actual melody of it. For example, the chorus of this... The actual chorus of it is da di da do do di da do di da do di da di di da do do di di do di da do di da. But when they sing it, sweet love song, not a lifetime. You know, you can just hear all the inflections that Tyrese is doing when he sings this song. None of those things would have even been conceived of had Louis Armstrong not done that, showed everybody how to put those types of inflections in popular music in the 1920s. And again, this is all, now I say it's all one thing now. But every song, you know, with a melody has a melody. Now, we might hear all kinds of runs and all kinds of stuff, all kinds of things on it, but it's one thing that my wife always says it to her vocal students, the same thing. You have to learn what the melody is first before you run, off, run over everything, run off of everything. Back in the 20s, the melodies were, were clearly stated because there were bands and recordings that stated them that way, and that's the way that people knew them. So when they heard people do embellishments, it was a big thing. It was like, whoa, what are they doing? And especially in Lewis's and Louis Armstrong's record where you heard both the straight and you heard the jazz invention on, at the same time. So those types of things, th those were the things that introduced that whole concept of varying a popular song into American society. And it just kept going from there into all, everybody's music that you can think of, even other genres. As we go into rock and roll, or, or what they call R&B in the 1940s, and you know, rock and roll, and as you get into all of those genres, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, going on through it, as you get into all of that, all of those kind of just effortless inventions that they did, all of that's owed to Louis Armstrong. It's all because he did it. It's all because he showed everybody. And because he had people behind him that, that saw his potential to be the first artist that could appeal to everyone in a time when the music that he was playing had this very dark and black connotation that, that his management decided that if he was given a chance to, to interpret these other songs that were usually closed off to black artists, that he would be able to show his genius and that would widen the scope for jazz appreciation. And that's just what it did and it seeped into every other type of music. So that's that's pretty much it. That's pretty much the idea there. Any uh